This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. Preserve and pass on memories with StoryWorth, the most meaningful gift for your family. Sign up today by going to storyworth.com slash gems, where you'll get $20 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash gems for $20 off. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 236. Well, I'm recording this in December of 2019, and I'm still picking the scotch tape out of my hair after a Christmas present wrapping frenzy, which actually resulted in me also mistakenly wrapping my grandson Davy's birthday presents in Christmas wrapping paper. <laughs> uh, it wasn't exactly my intention, but Davy's birthday is December 15th. So his presents are always on the counter. They're usually coming in at the same time other Christmas presents I've ordered are coming in. And somehow I managed to kind of throw them into the assembly line. So I'm going to be doing some unexpected unwrapping of gifts tonight so I can straighten out that little mess. Um, and for all of you longtime listeners, can you believe Davy is going to be 10 years old? Oh my gosh, it seems like yesterday that I was excitedly coming here on the podcast and announcing that my first grandson had been born. But yes, he's 10. And he's getting taller. <laughs> my how time flies and it's flying further and further away from our ancestors, is it not? And further away from the time in which they got their photographs taken, which can make the task of identifying and dating old photographs harder and harder. Well, do not fret, my friend, because I have the coolest free tech tool today to talk to you about that's going to help you zero in on the dates that your photographs were taken. David Lowe, who's a specialist in the photography collection of the New York Public Library, is going to be here today. He's joining me to tell you all about this great tool. And we're going to be talking about some important genealogical records also today that you might be missing over at Ancestry.com. Now, I wrote about this in my article, How to Find and Browse Unindexed Records at Ancestry. And you probably saw that in the Genealogy Gems newsletter and over at the website. Um, but this is such an important topic. I think we need to talk about it here together today. So we'll be doing that. But first, I want to hear from you. And we are going to do that next at the mailbox. So I've got a couple of emails here in the mailbox today. The first one comes from Christine. And she says, in my newspaper research at newspapers.com, I came across election results that included, of course, all the towns, townships, and the county covered by the newspaper. Though the election results were not of interest to me in my research, I was pleased to see residential information that can help me confirm my ancestors and records that include their address or town. Boundaries moved over the years, so my family may not have moved, but their location may have been reassigned, which gives me pause as I locate them in records. In this particular case, the last location I had for them was not listed, but the new location was detailed under the new name. Christine says that she put election results in quotation marks in her search over at, at newspapers, and she says, I found more information in my research area hoping this information will help other genealogists like me. That's a great strategy when you when you have these kind of moving, evolving locations to, to tie it together with election results. That's very cool, right? In newspapers. And she says, uh, your podcast and other offers are the best I've found and worthy of my genealogy budget. Oh, thank you, Christine. I'm happily retired and have time to soak it all in. I'm using your research plan to manage my findings. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're enjoying. We, we have lots of different resources here. Uh, so we're here to help. Thank you so much, Christine. Now, Mark wrote in and, and he's got a bit of a beef. And I don't know, I, I have a very small immediate family. So this isn't as much an issue for me. 
But I'm sure there are debates out there. And Mark is debating this question of how to describe family members, particularly to other family members. So he writes, I'm the de facto family historian from my huge Italian family. We had our 62nd annual family reunion. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. (laughs) 62 years. Wow. Last July. And as I have explained to family members, who is a third cousin and who is a second cousin once removed, I'm flummoxed as to why they have left ambiguity in family relationships. Why are second cousins and second cousins' children both referred to as once removed? Why isn't there a distinction such as second cousin once ascended and second cousin once descended so the vertical moves through the tree can be distinguished? I'm a data scientist, so I don't like ambiguity. (laughs) I can appreciate that. And, and that makes sense. And it's funny, I, I can see it's really the biggest challenge is when you're trying to explain it to somebody else, particularly in your family, who probably isn't in genealogy and is looking at you cross eyed trying to track what you're saying the relationship is. So what did I do? Okay, well, I see that this is an issue with for Mark. So I went to Google. And I googled exactly his phrase from his email, second cousin once ascended. I wanted to see, is this a thing? And it's a thing. Okay. So now maybe I'm the last person to have heard about this. But like I said, I think it's all about, you know, where your pain points are, that's where you focus. But there is a lot of conversation actually out on the web about this. And it I don't think it's not a thing. So that's good news for you, Mark, you can use this and, and you are absolutely on track. So the first website I came across was the Weenel Genealogy. It's W E I N E L. And it's it looks like a personal genealogy family website. And the page that Google took me to was called Relationships and Cousins. Okay, so I'm going to have a link to this in the show notes. So on this Relationships and Cousins page at weenel.com, they talk about first cousins and second cousins and third cousins and so on. And what does removed mean? And then there's a section, ascending or descending. So I'm just going to read this to you. It says the description describing a cousin being removed can be ambiguous. Yeah. (laughs) For example, a person who your first cousin once removed may be either your father's first cousin or your first cousin's child. And these are distinguished by the use of ascending or descending, where ascending describes generations older than you and descending for those younger than you. Often only the younger or descending generations are marked or annotated as descending. So you can check out this web page because they've got actually a little chart here put together. So you can take a look at this. Um, I also came across, it was dumbville.org, <laughs> D-U-M, dumbville.org. And, and then there again, I think this was a personal uh, family website. And then they talked about ascending and descending. But it looks like there's been a lot of conversation and maybe a lot of debate on this topic. And over at Wikipedia, they actually have places almost like message boards where you can have conversations. And there's a thread called cousins. And I think particularly Mark, you will find this very, very interesting. Down towards the bottom, uh, there's a section called asymmetric, not symmetric for cousins removed. And there's a discussion there about it. And one of the things this person says is, now I grant you that first cousin once removed, ascending slash descending are cumbersome constructions. But they fulfill the mandate that cross-generational terms be asymmetric. So of course, asymmetric means different and symmetric means the same. And what they say here is, uh, he said, he writes, now I grant you that first cousin once removed, ascending slash descending are cumbersome constructions. So it takes a little longer to explain it, right? But they fulfill the mandate that cross-generational terms be asymmetric. It's a pity we do not have the corresponding terms that Spanish does. He writes here, Tio Seguendo, which means second uncle, and Sobrino Seguendo, which is second nephew. But we have what we have, and these are the precise and correct terms that we use. Leaving ascending slash descending off is not another system, but rather it's a simplification that robs us of useful information. Aha, Mark, you've been vindicated. (laughs) When we hear it, we do not know where on the speaker's family tree to place the person referenced. 
with all our kinship terms, symmetric or asymmetric, we do know where. So you can absolutely use this to describe um, and, and provide further clarity to the description of cousins removed and all that. So there you go, Mark, you've got it. It's out there. Um, I'm guessing, and they're kind of saying it here that uh, in some ways, people just leave it off to kind of keep it simple. But it's interesting, because I think that actually probably contributes to why people who are not genealogists often kind of look confused. And they're like, well, whatever that means, you know, because they're having a hard time visualizing it on the tree. As a genealogist, I could see how it'd be easier to just start dropping that and to simplify what you're saying. Because in a way, the whole tree, all those records, you know how it is. It's all in our head. It's in our database. So we're in this all the time. And we can visualize it. We can see it. We're working with the records. So it's a way of simplification, but it may not be that helpful. So here, we can use ascending or descending in conjunction with that. Anyway, I'll have links, we won't have a big debate about it here, but I'll have links in the show notes for all you folks so you can go check it out and decide if that's how you want to describe your family tree as well. And finally, I have uh, an email here from Audrey in Texas. And she says, I'm new to podcasts, and I love listening to your podcasts. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, I started a new job over two months ago, and your podcasts keep me sane. Oh, I'm so glad. Gosh. Uh, First of all, driving from Austin to San Antonio, Texas is a tough drive, and I am now doing it weekly. I was struggling to fit in any genealogy with my new job, so I turned to podcasts to keep me in the genealogy loop. I've listened to many different podcasts, and yours is my favorite. Oh, thank you, Audrey. You're my favorite, too. Um, I learned something new every week and actually quite entertaining. It really helps pass the drive time quickly. Thank you. Well, you are so welcome. Gosh. And you know what? Texas is a really big place. So if you're commuting in Texas, <laughs> just like in California, you can be on the road for a long time. And I got to tell you, the traffic here has like quadrupled since I moved here five years ago. So I'm really happy that Genealogy Gems can help make that drive a little more enjoyable. Although I don't know, my husband doesn't really have the same reaction when we're in the car here together in Texas, and I'm talking his ear off. <laughs> I'm not sure if he considers that entertaining. But seriously, um, I always enjoy hearing what all you folks are doing while you're listening to the show. And if there's something that you would love to hear about here on the podcast, maybe it's ascending and descending. I mean, whatever it is, or if you have any questions, or if you have a comment like Christine or Mark or Audrey, drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. All right, well, up next is that terrific tech resource I talked to you about at the beginning of the show. uh, And we are going to be talking to David Lowe of the New York Public Library. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Do you have old family photos that you're trying to identify? Hopefully they have the photographer's imprint on them, which might include their name and their location. And if they do, 
then you can research the photographer to try and find out maybe when they were in business and therefore narrow down the time frame when the photo was taken. Well, in this gem, we're going to take a look at a website that can help you research those photographers. It's called the Photographer's Identities Catalog. It's also known as PIC, and it's hosted by the New York Public Library. Now, this is an experimental interface to a collection of data about photographers, studios, manufacturers, and anybody else involved in the production of photographic images. David Lowe, the photography specialist at the New York Public Library, is the driving force behind this project. So I've invited him to the podcast so he can help you tap into this terrific resource. Welcome to the podcast, David. It's great to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. I think it's uh, very safe to say that uh, pretty much all of my listeners probably have at least one or two old family photos sitting around that they are having trouble identifying. Uh, In fact, that's exactly how I came across the Photographer's Identities Catalog website. So I'd love to have you tell us, uh, what's the origin of this database? Kind of what got you started in it? And where did you get your initial data from? Well, the uh, catalog came about basically from my own uh, needs to have such a resource. Um, I I rather stumbled my way into this position here where I've suddenly... um, was needing to sort of manage a collection of you know, upwards of a half million photographs and uh, just trying to get a get a grasp of what we had, of who was in the collection, to help me date things, to help me organize things. Um, and there, there was at that time another database uh, hosted by the George Eastman House Museum, now the, uh, now the George Eastman Museum, which was uh, the work of some researchers there. Uh, that database was not being actively maintained and it was, uh, it, was, it was starting to show its age and I was afraid that it was going to go offline. So I started making a copy of a lot of the data for my own use in that event- eventuality. In fact, that, that did happen eventually. Um, and so feeling like I had possibly you know this treasure trove of information that I certainly needed and perhaps others did as well. Um, I continued working with that data and cleaning it and finding other sources of information to to generate more information. Eventually, the original publishers did go live with their own copy. So there is sort of a second database that's similar to but not not identical to uh, what PIC became. And so, uh, yeah, I've continued working with this data for, oh, I guess I began in about 2002. Three and it went online in uh, 2013, I believe. So it was a long time in in the making. So it's helped me a lot in terms of just being able to identify photographs, something that uh, be of interest to your uh, to your listeners, and dating photographs, uh, trying to figure out where a photograph may have been taken, things like that. Right, and I know that um, you said that the George Eastman database had a lot of information about photographers. I know I've seen catalogs in Google Books where they list, you know, all the photographers in New Jersey or, you know, a state or but not really across the country. I don't know if I've seen an entire catalog. Maybe there is one. But are you pulling from lots of different resources like this? And when you come across photos there at the New York Public Library, and you see a photographer, do you check and, and then add them in as well? I mean, how does the data get increased? I, I do. Uh, the information that's in PIC now is um, a combination of my own research when I find uh, a photographer, when I find a name that I, I can't find um, information in other sources. Of course, I have to, then I have to go back and do um, some genealogical research on, on that name. Uh, so there, are, there is a lot of my own original research in there, but I am also relying on the excellent work of other uh, researchers and scholars and genealogists some of whom are publishing their information in, you know, big, big uh, bibliographic uh, or, or biographic uh, catalogs. Some of which are are well known, certainly within the the photography research community. Uh, but sometimes it's a uh, it's a regional scholar with a particular interest in, you know, say, Michigan photographers, and uh, they've toiled away for a for a long time, uh, and it may exist as a PDF or on a personal website and you know I, I, I 
try to make use of that and index their work and drive, you know, point someone to that original source. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully any sort of uh, more in-depth sort of biographical information that I'm not recording is, you know, more people will have access to that. It'll be easier for them to find. Um, and then also, you know, the same names will sometimes appear in multiple uh, in multiple sources. So if there are ambiguities or uh, conflicting information, that um, someone who finds a name in, in PIC can go to the original sources and sort of determine what they feel is perhaps more reliable or more up to date or uh, more pertinent to their interests or their needs. Right. It can really point them to other sources, which is terrific. Right. If I've made an error, too, you know, someone can go back to my sources and see where I perhaps made a mistake or a, a, a judgment call that maybe they wouldn't have made. Right, right. Now, Chris, today, everybody thinks they're a photographer, right? <laughs> everybody's got a phone, everybody's uh, constantly taking photographs. And I imagine, obviously, you can't include everybody. When we think about it as a genealogist, we're really interested in time frames. So we tend to be thinking about a heavy emphasis on 19th and early 20th century photographers. Do you have a specific time frame? And, and in addition to that criteria for who you put in and who you leave out? It's a good question because, uh, yeah, as, as you say, you know, there are plenty of, you know, working photographers now or hobbyists, serious hobbyists, you know, um, that they would like to be included. And it's just, it, it's, it's just not realistic for me to be able to keep up with, uh, you know, the entire you know, population of people who make photographic images today. Um, I think fortunately for uh, working photographers today, they can sort of document themselves through cheap or free websites and whatnot. Um, so yes, my focus is more on the 19th through the mid 20th century, but because the the database is serving sort of a dual function of, uh, on the one hand, the sort of genealogical work that we're talking about now, but also sort of documenting the history of, uh, of the medium of photography. It's sort of a, an art historical database as well. Um, as we get closer and closer to our current moment, I am more reliant on the judgments of uh, cultural institutions, uh, museums, historical societies, and what what their curators have decided needs to be uh, kept and, and representing our current moment. So there are contemporary photographers, but I'm in those cases, I'm more deferential to um, other curators who, you know, who are making those sorts of decisions and what they feel should be studied uh, yeah. from our own current moment. Now, for the 19th century stuff, uh, 19th century photographers, I, I am much more uh, inclusive. If I find a reference to someone, you know, in a business directory, I might not know whether there are existing photographs, you know, anywhere that anybody has there, but I found evidence of them existing as a professional photographer, and I will add them in. Mm -hmm. No, that makes total sense. And that actually really helps. You know, right. we, t we talk about here on the show that it's important to understand what the purpose of any particular database is in order to know how to get the most and the best out of it. And uh, it right. sounds like in many ways, our focus is kind of um, cross paths. Coming up right after this, Dave and I are going to talk about specifically how to find the photographers that you're looking for in PIC. My favorite part about the holidays is reconnecting with family. I love swapping stories and reliving moments together. But keeping these memories alive can be hard. And that's why I'm giving my family the most meaningful gift this year, StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you engage your loved ones no matter where they live and help them tell the story of their lives through unique and thought-provoking questions about their memories and their personal thoughts. The way it works is every week, StoryWorth emails your family member different story prompts, questions you've never thought to ask, like what have been some of your life's greatest surprises and what's one of the riskiest things you've ever done? After one year, StoryWorth will compile every answered question and photographs that you choose to include into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. That way, it's not just a one-time conversation, but it's a book that you can refer to again and again as a vital part of your family history. 
You never know what family history story Worth is going to uncover. My dad went into great detail in one of his answers about the fact that I was a notorious sleepwalker as a child, something I certainly don't remember. And he painted a picture in words of his grandmother and her home that's absolutely priceless. So preserve and pass on memories with Story Worth, the most meaningful gift for your family. Sign up today by going to storyworth.com slash gems. That will get you $20 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash gems for $20 off. So let's talk about finding photographers. So I've been looking at small photos I have um, that come out of Minnesota, and one of the photographers was uh, C.J. Ostrom. So I put in Ostrom. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how the search engine works, because I noticed that it does give me kind of a wide variation. Certainly names even sound like Ostrom, but don't even begin with an O. So tell us how that works. And are there search operators? Are there ways in which we can manipulate the words to help the database better understand the spelling and things that we're looking for? That can be a little tricky um, because uh, the database does contain about 130,000 names, um, and there were we had to make some uh, some decisions on how strict or or, or loose the search uh, the search was, and we opted for showing more results than fewer. Hopefully, we. We struck a, 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 a good balance there because there are also other operators that you can use to delimit your uh, search. So, for instance, if you know uh, that your photographer is working in, you know, uh, in England, you can limit those results to just photographers who are associated with, with England. Um, if you suspect that your photographer may have been, you know, a female photographer, you can limit by gender and limit those results in that way. Uh, If you know a little bit more about photo history specifically and you know that the photograph that you have is uh, what's known as a cabinet card, Mm -hmm. uh, you delimit it by that, and that might help get you closer to your results. Oh, that sounds great. So there are filters that we see built into the search engine. Does it support in any kind way operators, Boolean operators, you know, like an asterisk or quotation marks or things like that? (laughs) <laughs> Funny, I actually have to check. It's been a while since I've thought about that. I, th- I, I think that um, I think that opens it up even still further. You get uh, you. I, th- I just did try with an asterisk, but yeah, there's there's a lot under the hood. I'm not the programmer of. Oh, the no problem. So, so <laughs> well, I, and I always say know, we can always try them and you know see if it does make a difference right. or not. So that's always good to know. And you mentioned England, so that brings me to my next question: is is this international? It is international. Um, there is, uh, if you go to the site, you will you will find the page is sort of split in three columns. The left is for a search your your actual search criteria. The center uh, is a list of the names uh, that 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 come up when you do a search. And on the right uh, half of the screen, you will see a world map. When you first go, you'll find uh, you know certain parts of the world are brightly lit up. Uh, dense with little dots of, of light, um, and that will give you a, a sense of the uh, geographic distribution of, of, the, of the information in there. You, you can kind of see our strengths and weaknesses from, from the outset and where we have more work uh, that we'd like to do. Uh, certainly, uh, America and most of Europe is very well represented, and that's reflective of the sort of the, the volume of research which has been done. Uh, there are certain areas of South America which are fairly well represented, parts of, uh, parts of Asia, and, but you, you, know, you can kind of see it also follows a bit with uh, population density. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, we are international. In fact, we even include uh, photographers who uh, worked on the moon and outer space. Oh, wow. There have, <laughs> there, there have been photographers there. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Now, one of the ways that I know I, I have been searching for photographers in the past is I go look at the U.S. federal census. So, and a lot of those are free. I know in 1880, uh, it's it's available for free on Ancestry and on Family Search and MyHeritage. And, and uh, you can go and search by occupation. I know I did that on Ancestry. And that brought up about 9,100 people. So there were a lot of photographers in 1880. 
is that data also that is that a method in which you might have looked for people? And if not, and if our listeners are coming across photographers, either through the, those types of searches or their own cards, their own photos, can they contribute that information? Yes, they can, um, and I would love it if they did. Um, and to, to answer the first question, yes, um, I, I, I do. Uh, I'm a daily user of Ancestry and uh, myself, uh, Fold3 for the business directories. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, when I find a name, uh, and I, it, it, whether I if I don't find that person listed in Pick already or in another of my uh, go-to sources, then I I do start uh, with. Some basic uh, genealogical looking for them in the in business directories and in censuses, and try to flesh out the basic details of their lives. Now, I'm not able, to, just given the volume of what I'm working with, I'm not able to do you know super in depth. But if I can get the nail down the basic facts of their lives and their careers, um, and and move on. Um, and yes, as far as uh, contributing information to us, uh, you can either email us directly at. The email uh, is pick, P-I-C, at nypl.org. But there's also a little feedback button on the bottom right of your screen, and you can send us, uh, send us what you know there, whether it's corrections or a, a, a new photographer name that we, we don't have. Oh, fantastic. And kind of crowdsource some data and continue to grow it because it's just a tremendous resource. Is there anything about it that uh, you think I, maybe I haven't asked about that you think folks need to know so they can get the most out of it? Well, if any of your listeners are at uh, at, at institutions which have uh, which have photographers, uh, certainly I'd love to hear from you know historical societies or, or regional institutions which may have uh, in depth information on on areas where my coverage is not uh, thorough enough. Mm-hmm. Send me your list of photographers. I'd love to include them, and I can point uh, point users you know back to your institution to do uh, you know more research there. It, it's constantly a work in progress, so um, I, I do try to uh, focus on uh, the underrepresented where possible. I figure that if someone is needing to research uh, one of the, you know, uh, great photographers of the 19th century, it, it's enough for me to point them out to other sources, and I don't need to retell the story of, a, of an Edward Moybridge. But uh, there are, you know, lesser knowns that would be more useful uh, for, for folks like your, your listeners. Right. Photographers that may not have been famous in any way, but they took a lot of photographs at their little studio of the local area and the people, and uh, they made their own contribution. And you're making such a contribution just sharing this database. I mean, you guys could have kept this just for internal purposes, and it's fantastic mm-hmm. that you've made it available because there are so many people looking, and it's so valuable to be able to see not only did I pull up this photographer, but here's the time frame that you guys think that uh, he was in operation, and that gives us something to go with. Uh, very quick, as, as far as uh, sharing the sharing the information for any of your listeners or yourself who may be um, a, a bit techy and want to actually play with all of the data or have it for your own means, you can actually download the the entirety of this data uh, and use it for yourself in any way which you choose. Uh, it, all of that is available on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, if you go to the website, you can find a link to that. You feel free to download it and do anything you want with it. Wow, that's terrific. I will have links, of course, to everything that we're talking about on the show notes Great. page for this episode. And I was going to say, before I let you go, people might get there and see this map, and they see a ton of photographers on the west coast of Africa. Tell our listeners right. why that is. <laughs> so I include um, I include um, location in data for birth locations, for death locations, for specific studio addresses, um, and sometimes for I know somebody was working in a particular city, but I don't know exactly where, or mm-hmm. I know they were in a state, or a, a, sometimes even just a country, but I don't know where exactly they were working. So I have specific points for all of those. But in some cases, I know someone was born in 1824. I just don't know where at all. But I still want to include include that information. But since every bit of this information is tied to a, a location, I have had to put that point on the map at a sort of nowhere point 
So I, those are the geographic coordinates, zero, zero, zero latitude, zero longitude. And that happens to fall uh, on the... Uh, on the west coast of Africa. Uh, this is actually an, a, a thing in the cartography world that uh, I didn't just make that up. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's called Null Island, N-U-L-L, uh, because it, it, there's actually nothing at all there. It's just a point in the ocean. But uh, it's used to, uh, to put something on a map when you don't know where it belongs on the map. Great. So uh, we may find a photographer, but he may be out swimming in the ocean, but that didn't mean that's where he lived. So maybe we'll have information we can contribute and get him back on land. Exactly. You can help me move him off the island. Exactly. Well, David, I so appreciate you not only being here on the show, but sharing all this data with uh, so many people who I think are going to be thrilled to hopefully make some progress on identifying and narrowing down these uh, photographs that they're working on. And um, anytime you've got something to share with us about all the photography and the, the photographic images, I know you guys have an amazing collection there at New York Public Library. I hope you'll shoot me an email and let's get you back on the show, okay? I will. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And my heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. In this gem, we're going to talk about how to find and browse unindexed records at Ancestry.com. It's your better browsing checklist. Now, browse-only collections at Ancestry and other genealogy websites are sometimes viewed as inaccessible, but they are actually a hidden treasure. We're going to talk about how to access these browse-only collections at Ancestry and open the lid on your family history research. Now, in the past, we've written articles at Genealogy Gems about how to access browse-only content at FamilySearch.org, and we've talked about it here on the podcast. Well, many readers said that it opened up a whole new world of genealogy records to them that they didn't know they were missing. The good news is that FamilySearch is not alone in offering browse-only content. Ancestry.com also has browse-only collections of digitized records. Knowing how to search and browse records effectively is really critical because you can't just rely on the hints. Ancestry, for example, only provides hints from about the top 10% of their most popular databases. And that means if you only spend time on reviewing hints, you're missing a massive amount of genealogical information available in all the other records. Now, typically, you'll be using the search feature to find those other records. However, not all records are searchable. And that's because after the long process of acquiring the rights to digitize and publish a genealogical record collection, therefore, it can take some time to locate a record within one of these collections. But I think you'll agree it's more convenient to look through them from the comfort of your own home rather than renting microfilm or traveling to a far off location. So here's your checklist for better browsing. First, Let's talk about how to search and find browse-only collections at Ancestry. Now, while Ancestry.com doesn't make it quite as easy as FamilySearch to find browse-only or partially indexed databases, it's still very much worth the effort. So step number one is to head to the card catalog. Now, from the main menu on the Ancestry website, select Search and then Card Catalog. Step two is to search and filter. 
So in the upper left corner, you're going to search the catalog by title and or keyword. However, if you know the type of record that you're looking for, such as military records, the best place to start is by filtering for that category. If the list is long, you can then search within the category by keywords. Step number three is to determine if the records are searchable. So when you get to the entry for that particular collection and you don't see a search box on the left-hand side, then you can assume that this collection has not yet been indexed. And that means you can't search by keywords or other data. Instead of the search box, you'll typically see the source information box at the top of the page. Now let's talk about how to filter these browse only genealogical records. The first step is to look at the browse this collection box and you'll find that in the upper right hand corner of the card catalog entry page for that collection that you're looking at. The filtering options presented are going to depend on the way that the collection is organized. So for example, when I pull up the Nevada County marriages 1862 to 1993 database, there is no search box for searching and in the browse this collection box, they provide a drop down menu that allows me to filter by county. So because of the way the records are organized and placed on their website, they're able to let me filter down to at least the county level to narrow things down. Step number two is then to make a selection. So in my example, once I selected a county, I can also filter down by record books. So even though I can't search for names, I can still zero in on the portion of the collection that's most relevant to my search. Now our next item on the checklist, how to browse these records at Ancestry. So once you've selected the available filters, you're going to find yourself on the viewer page. You'll be looking at the digitized records themselves. You'll see the first image there on the screen, and you may also see a film strip layout along the bottom of the screen. And that comes in really handy for navigating through the web pages. And of course, navigation is crucial since we can't search by names and keywords. So let's take a closer look at the ways that you can navigate on the viewer page. Uh, one way is through the film strip viewer at the bottom. And if you don't see the film strip viewer, look for the box that has the number of pages on it. And on the left hand side of that box is a little icon that looks like a film strip. If you click that, it reveals the viewer. And of course, that little box with the page number that will tell you you're on page one. But if you see that there are 300 pages and you know you're looking somewhere in the middle of the alphabet, let's say you might want to jump to 150 and just kind of get a feel for where does that land you in this particular collection. So you can use that number box to jump around within the collection, which is really handy because some of these have an awful lot of pages. And of course, you'll also find left and right arrows. So when you are sitting on page one, you can click the right arrow to the right. If you're on page 36, you can go left or you can go right and move up and down the pages. Now let's talk a moment about finding and using the original index for this collection, the one that came with it. A lot of records that were originally bound in books like the collection of the Nevada marriages, they include index pages. So in this particular book that's been digitized and put on Ancestry, the index appears at the beginning of the book. So if you look really closely at the film strip images that you're seeing along the bottom of the screen, you can spot which pages look like lists that are indexes and which ones are actually pages of records. So even though Ancestry hasn't had the chance to index the records yet, they are indexed in the book. And that's going to help us be able to find which pages to look for. So if I'm looking for briquettes in this index, I may see, oh, it's on this particular page. Now, that page may not be exactly the same as the image number, but you'll be able to use the page number field to jump to the general area within the collection much quicker. Now, I want to mention the about box on the card catalog entry because it often includes really important information about whether or not the collection has an index. So one example of this is the Canada 
Photographic Albums of Settlement 1892 to 1917 Record Collection. Now, this is a browse-only series of digitized photo albums by Canada's Department of the Interior that were taken between 1892 and 1917. And the collection description in the About box contains some really helpful instructions. In fact, it says, at the beginning of each album, you will find a table of contents with a brief description of each photograph and the photograph number. Use these tables to help you browse to the photograph of interest. So as you can see, taking a few extra moments to read about the collection itself not only gives you the backstory and gives you the context in which it was created, but it may actually make the browsing much easier because it will tell you what's available within the collection and what to look for in the images. You can also save some time when browsing between volumes. So remember that browse this collection box I mentioned? It was in the upper right hand corner of the card catalog entry page. Well, this handy menu is also embedded in the record viewer. And the viewer is the page in which we're actually looking at the digitized records. So if I'm looking at records in that Nevada marriage collection, and I realize, oh, I'm in the wrong volume, I don't have to click my back button and start all over again. Rather, at the top of the page where you see the title of the collection, you'll see below it kind of a subheading. And that's telling you which volume that you're in or which section of the collection that you're in if it's been divided up. If you need to switch to a different book, album, or other portion of the collection, you don't have to hit that back button and start over. You can instead click that subheading and a browse structure menu is going to appear showing you all of the other options within the collection. This is the same menu that you saw in the browse this collection box. So all you have to do is click the one that you want and you will instantly be switched over to the other volume. You can kind of think of it as, you know, working with a series of books in the library and you put the volume you're in back on the shelf and you grab the one that you need back off the shelf. Now let's talk a moment about browsing indexed records because this browsing isn't just valuable within records that are not indexed. There will be times when even though a record collection is indexed, you may still want to browse it. Browsing is definitely not just for unindexed records. Many gems can be found by browsing a database that you've already searched using the search box. You might spot things like neighbors of interest or maybe some surnames from your family tree that you didn't know were there. So even when you're working with a record collection that has a search box, look to the right of the search box for the browse this collection column. Now, before we wrap up, I want to share with you how to find the newest records at Ancestry.com. And that's because the records that are most likely to not yet be indexed and therefore only be browsable are the newest records that they've added. So if you're looking to bust through a brick wall, here's a great way to find the newest records that just might help you do it. First step is to go to the card catalog. Now, from the main menu on the Ancestry website, remember, we go to search and then card catalog. Step number two, we've got to sort the records. So in the right hand column, you're going to find a sort by menu. Select date added. Step three, newest record view. So the card catalog is now going to be presented to you in the order in which the records were added. The newest record, of course, is going to appear at the top of the list. Step number four is to filter that list. So use the filters along the left side of the page to filter the collections by record type, location, or date. And then you can use the search boxes to target keywords. This will give you results that include your keyword starting with the newest collections. You know, it's clear that making a small investment of time and getting to know the search and browsing features of any website that you're using can really pay off big. We've got three other articles and podcast episodes I want to recommend to you if you want to learn more about this and how to maximize your genealogy research efforts. One is the article I already referred to, which was Searching Browse Only Records at Family Search. We also have an article called Four Tips for Getting the Most from Ancestry.com. And if you're a Genealogy Gems Premium member, Premium Podcast Episode 125 
touches on using the Ancestry Library Edition and other genealogy databases at your public library. Head to the show notes for this episode and you'll find links to all three of those resources. Happy searching! Profile America, Saturday, December 14th. Tomorrow is Bill of Rights Day, in honor of the day when the first 10 amendments to the Constitution took effect in 1791. The Bill of Rights added specific freedoms and government limitations to the three-year-old Constitution. Among them are enshrined the freedom of religion, speech, the press, the right to peaceably assemble and bear arms. Also the right to petition the government and be secure in property. When the Bill of Rights was passed, America's population of about 4 million in the then 14 states had about 100 newspapers exercising the First Amendment freedom contained in the Bill of Rights. Today's population is around 330 million and chooses from nearly 7,500 newspaper publishers nationwide. You can find more facts about America's people, places, and economy from the American Community Survey at census.gov. Well, thank you so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode 236. Um, I hope you're excited to go check out PIC and check the dates on those old family photos that you have that uh, you haven't been able to date so far. This could really help you to then narrow the field and then get into the right record collections to find out who maybe those people are. So thank you so much to David Lowe at the New York Public Library for telling us all about that. I so appreciate it. And um, I hope that you enjoyed the chat about Ancestry and the browsable records. I think there's a lot of strategies there that uh, you can use on a regular basis. So be sure and tap into the show notes for this episode. And how do we find show notes? I get that question a lot. Well, if you're using the the Genealogy Gems app, gosh, they're right there in front of you. Uh, If you scroll down, you'll see all the show notes there. There's a a more reader-friendly version of show notes at our website. So you go to genealogygems.com and in the menu under podcast, click on the Genealogy Gems podcast. And so you're looking for the link for episode 236. And that's going to have everything written up for you. We try to make it as convenient as possible. And a little bit on a hiatus right now, uh, home for the holidays, if you will, which is always nice. But I am going to be hitting the road uh, right after the first of the year. So if you're thinking about a little genealogy trip, maybe you want to get something going in January, I am going to be speaking again at St. George, Utah. So we are bringing the Genealogy Roots event that we presented um, in Sandy, which is just outside of Salt Lake City. We're taking that to St. George, Utah. And Jeff Rasmussen from Legacy Family Tree webinars is going to be joining me there. It's basically a two-person show for two days, and it's us with you talking genealogy at the Senior Expo is going to be hosting the Genealogy Roots Educational Event. And, you know, St. George is gorgeous. If you haven't been there, it's on the southern end of Utah, and it's absolutely beautiful. There is so much recreationally to do in that area. It's a wonderful venue we're going to be at, and it's just a couple of hours drive from Las Vegas. So so there's lots to do in that general area. So if you're thinking about a trip, this could be kind of a fun one. Head to SeniorExpo.org slash Genealogy Roots. And of course, I'll have a link in the show notes for that. Uh, This is a really nice, intimate setting. There'll be a couple of hundred of us maybe. And uh, so you've really got me and Jeff Rasmussen to yourself for two days. And we pretty much get a chance to visit with each and every attendee and love hearing what you're working on and answering your questions. And um, it's just a wonderful time. So consider joining us there. And then thereafter, I will be at Roots Tech. This is the 10th anniversary for Roots Tech. And I'm proud to say it will be my ninth Roots Tech. I didn't go the very first year, um, but I did go thereafter and have spoken every year. And I'm going to be doing lots of speaking this year. Uh, On Wednesday at 
930. I believe they've moved this class to 930 on Wednesday. It's reconstruct your ancestors stories with Google. This is a real, you know, taking all the different Google strategies, but truly building a complete story that culminates in little quick video at the end that tells the whole story. So I think you'll really enjoy that. Then later that day, I'm going to be doing three cool cases how to identify your photos. This is so timely. And yes, it's, in fact, it's why I got on the phone with David Lowe, because I was working on this presentation. It's brand new. And I came across PIC. And so that was a tremendous boon to kind of add to the class. But this class is really going to be, I think, exciting in that we're going to talk about a real process that you can follow tools like PIC that you may not be aware of that are out there. We're going to use those and we're going to apply them to real case studies. So it's an exciting, really information packed hour that I'm hoping that you're going to walk away going, wow, there is newfound hope for identifying my old photos. So we'll show you cases where we really do that. Right now, they also have on Thursday at 4.30 p.m., I'm going to be on a panel, and that's Genealogy in Your Ears, Podcasters Talk Podcasting. So Drew Smith over at Genealogy Guys will be uh, hosting, and I'll be on the panel with him, along with um, a couple of other genealogy podcasters. And we're going to talk about how podcasting came to be, what it is, how it works, what it's like, why did we get into it, and just answer your questions and, and talk to the listeners. So we're really excited about doing that. And I will also right now it's scheduled for Thursday at 1.30. We're going to be doing the genealogist Google search me methodology, but it's for 2020. You may have seen my genealogist Google search methodology at a conference, or if you're a premium member, I have a video there. This is a brand new, you know, it's like second edition. It's the 2020 edition of this presentation. And so much is changing. Um, it, what we have been doing still works, but we have some new paradigms that are shifting and, and that needs to shift how we search and what we're, what we're doing. So I'm going to be really bringing you all the latest information. Uh, it's a completely new revamped presentation. So if you're going to Roots Tech, I certainly hope you will join me for that. That's just kind of a, everybody needs to know this stuff <laughs> in order to be able to get out on the internet and find what you're looking for. Not everything's on the internet. But there are lots of records on the internet. But more importantly, the internet is going to be that avenue by which you find the offline records. That's where we do our research and our homework before we go offline. It's an important topic. So there we got it. Bill will be there with me at Roots Tech. We will have our booth right up front. You'll walk in the front door. All the, you know, ancestry and my heritage will be out up front. And we are, if you look just slightly to the right, we are in the front row and uh, in booth 1303 and 1402, two booths together, right smack in the front. And here on genealogygems.com slash Roots Tech, you'll find a map at the bottom of the page so you can see exactly where we're going to be. So come by and say hi. <laughs> I'd love to see you there. Um, let's see here. What else is going on? Well, I hope you'll follow me over at Instagram. If you're on Instagram, I do lots of behind the scenes there. And of course, we have our Facebook page uh, at facebook.com slash genealogy gems. If you're a premium member, you'll have a new episode in about two weeks. And finally, I wanted to mention because I don't remember if I mentioned it last month, Family Tree Magazine podcast is back up and running. So I hope you've already heard that or, or been made aware of it. Of course, I have been hosting that podcast almost as long as I've been doing this one, which started in 2007. I think we started, it was either late 2007 or 2008. Um, we launched the Family Tree Magazine podcast. And I've been hosting it and I'm so excited that it's back. Now that Family Tree Magazine has been purchased by a new company, by Yankee Publishing, they've got that whole move all done and the podcast is out of hiatus and we're just really excited. So I've had some great guests already and there'll be lots more to come. So check out the Family Tree Magazine podcast. And of course, I hope you're enjoying the Lisa's Picks column in the magazine. I have a two page spread every issue where I'm just kind of sharing my favorite stuff, whether it's a place to go, a, a record collection to use, a tech gadget that I'm currently using, all my favorite things. Um, those are on the Lisa's Picks column. So check it out. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.